What's up, everyone, and welcome to Tune Up, a Shop Monkey podcast where we talk about the automotive industry and car care, specifically that 99% of your car's life that's spent outside of the dealership. In this episode, we discuss young professionals interested in joining the auto industry. This customer says cars run a little hot. I have no idea what it could be. How to get involved and what shops can do to attract top talent. I'm Justin Simpson, and I'm joined by Zach Buffum, and the two of us, along with a bunch of our other colleagues, make up the hooligans in this room and your Tune Up team. All of us have various perspectives, passions, insights in cars, and we're super stoked to talk to you. What's up, Zach? What's up, Justin? Happy to be here, man. Yeah, I'm so stoked to be here, too. And we got all our friends. It's going to be a great episode. This is going to be a good day, dude. This is a great topic. Great idea. Oh, stoked about it. But to start the shenanigans, nothing nothing would give me more <laughs> pleasure at this moment than to introduce our crew and their nicknames. But hey, think about it. There's the theme here. I want to see if you guys can guess it. There is a theme. In, in pole Top position, secret. P1, we have Jonathan 5 Series Moretti. What's up, man? What's up, everybody? Good to see you. <laughs> Feels P2. good to be out here in the front. You you have any comments on that, Moretti? Five series? No? Uh the five series. Uh beautiful, beautiful car. If we're talking E39 uh of five series, that's my that's my go-to. Uh I, I back it good in, man. in every every way. <laughs> okay. All right. In P2, we have Mike Renault Clio Bordeaux. <laughs> lot of french there man beautiful a lot of french hey, everyone. yeah if i had to guess that was the the tie in there but uh Moretti's not german so i'm at a loss i don't know i don't know anything about Renault's. so all right well you're gonna have to keep listening see see if you can figure it out p3 we got gallagher grand caravan wilson all right so the height up to this plastic part it's everybody i'm is that because i have a lot of kids that's the <laughs> <laughs> could be could that's be. the only thing i can come up with on that one all right, and then we got Lucas Aranera Conyer. The drifting is nice. What's going on, everyone? Fun fact, uh, Mike, you're gonna love it. That car has an LS3 in it, and it's advertised as a supercar. Pretty cool. Ooh, okay, so we're talking sports sedans, or mm. uh, well, you know, no, the Clio is like a hot with. hatch, isn't it? <laughs> Gallagher just it sticking take out the totally crew. Sure. To figure out <laughs> what the topic is. Do you want to just spoil it for them, Zach? Sure. They are traditionally unreliable vehicles. Oh, how oh, dare traditionally you. Traditionally unreliable. You okay, cut grand, me deep. The Grand Caravan fits. My he uncle even asked him why he likes the 5 Series. <laughs> In yeah. what world is a BMW unreliable? Where have you oh, been getting yeah. your information? Of the BMWs, ready of of all of them, I've seen some caravans. Here's the thing: if you been get going the, for a long time, man, I don't know. If, if you get the the five series, like the the five forty, uh, you might run into some trouble. But if you if you get the the smaller spec with the six in it, the five thirties, actually. You're going 200,000 miles in that car. That's a, that's a, you gotta, you gotta be smart with your BMW choices, right? Knowledge drop. Yeah. Now, if you get the, uh, you know, uh, well, I'll stop there. Do you get anything <laughs> other than this <laughs> specific yeah. model? Other. <laughs> you get literally anything else. Guys, we, we did give you an option though. If you would like to provide Zach and I a nickname, uh, you're welcome to on the fly do so now or forever hold your peace. Zach uh, insults his guests, uh, buff them, <laughs> <laughs> and Justin, partner in crime. <laughs> I was going on the unreliable car side of things, but you know, okay, cut us, cut it deep. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying, you're going to throw us under the bus as unreliable uh, relation to vehicles. <laughs> you get it right back, okay? This is how it works in a shop, okay? You don't come in throwing out jabs, not getting catching some on the way back. That's yeah, all I'm it's saying. It's true. It's true.
So like Zach, I, note to self for us, don't <laughs> insult BMWs for Moretti ever. <laughs> That's a hot, hot topic. Yeah. I no, was, I'm I was so sorry, explaining. guys. I thought we were, I thought we were having fun. I thought we were just have, having a little <laughs> sparring match here. My bad. First of all, I love everybody here. Uh, take it all back. I love you. Oh, so yeah. good. Well, I think we could go uh, with Buffum. Thanks, Buffum could be a Pinto. It's just this, like oh, you know, that's what I was gonna guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I wanted. That's what I was hoping. Ooh, a Pinto wagon. Yeah, Pin- but Pintos are cool. They might be very unreliable, but they're so cool. Great till they fireball. Yeah, about- fair. Um, be- before we <laughs> jump in, one one more kind of quick thirty second commentary on the EV side. So. When you're looking at top vehicle manufacturers in the US, let's look at electric vehicle manufacturers specifically as a subset of that. Which is your personal favorite and here to stay? And which do you think will be non-existent in 10 years time? Uh, 30 seconds, Moretti, let's go with you. Oh gosh, you give me 30 seconds to answer such a <laughs> dense question. I mean, the the big automakers aren't going anywhere. So I'm I'm gonna ignore the Fords and everything and I'm just gonna look at like Canoe, Lucid, uh uh Tesla. I mean Tesla's here. I think they I think they're too no one's too big to fail, but I think they're not going anywhere. Um I think it'll be interesting to see if the if um Rivian stays afloat or just gets absorbed by Ford. Um and uh, uh that, I, that i think i'm running out of time i need a ca- i need a clock um, <laughs> that's my that's my opinion i think you know most of the big established brands are going to stay obviously because what, what's going to happen to them um but uh, I, i'm i hope i'm hopeful for rivian uh and i'm i'm also hopeful for the brands like canoe and uh who's making that little truck wolf wolf it's not wolf from oh yeah you know what yeah, i'm talking about i know what you're talking about yeah, but those I, are like more one-off custom, right? Like that's not going to yeah. be like mass production, is it? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my opinion, and, and I hope that we see more small batch enthusiast brand EVs that can survive in some way. Um, that would be I, I would hope to see a future that allows for that, where it's not just Ford and Hyundai and you know and all the established brands just taking back over. I think there's a really fun opportunity and i hope as enthusiasts that we see smaller brands find a way to survive nice nice and yeah Justin, i think that's that's really key all right lucas jump in i was just gonna say that's moretti's 30 seconds so yeah, um for sure <laughs> wow dude everyone today just coming at me all right you know what i'm into it <clears throat> you know? uh tesla's here to stay um I, I love how lucid looks I, as much as they blend in I don't know. It's a very premium car. If they can't get some traction on it, I feel like they might also get absorbed or they just might run out of capital doing some really high end cars. And then they're going to have to find a lot of high end uh, clients to keep uh, keep ramping up that demand. So Tesla, Lucid. Sorry, Lucid. Nice. Gallagher. I mean, I think it's clear. I'm, I'm hoping Rivian doesn't make it. Uh, wow. just gonna, just gonna dish hard here. Uh, Listen, no, just FYI, is being shorted thoughts, by Gallagher. That is yeah, the thoughts on this podcast are not by any means no. representative of the no. company as a whole. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I should dial that back. You can edit that. Uh, I don't know that Rivian's <laughs> going to stay. I think that I think that uh, I, I I don't know. I just I think it's very I think it's very polarizing look, and I think that'll I think some people like clearly some people are going to love it. Some people are really going to be not into it. It's fair um, that it's a niche product. They're making yeah, a niche product. Yeah, I think we can yeah. say that. Yeah. Uh, and I think I, was, I would agree. Tesla's kind of the front runner in terms of, um, you know, traction and, and looking to stay independent and, and kind of based on their size and scale already in their their market cap. Nice. Ordo? I actually don't like the way Tesla approaches things. So I'm kind of surprised to hear everyone's thoughts there. I, I don't like the over there updates, locking everything down. I, it sounds like they're going more towards a subscription model too, which for my car, I want to own it. I don't really want to subscribe to it. So I don't know. I hope that they don't continue down that trend. Um, I'll say I agree with Moretti. What really gets me excited is just like, you know, an electric car has like a pretty generic skateboard underneath. So everyone could potentially with smaller budgets, jump in and, and build their own cool niche car that fits like a, you know, their own niche market. So it'd be cool to see that uh, kick off. I think the, the potential's there at least. Um, I actually think that 
some manufacturers might go away of the dinosaur because of electric cars, like some big names, including my personal preference, Subaru. Like the thing that defines Subaru is its goofy drivetrain. So, or unique drivetrain. I don't know about goofy. And um, without that, you know, which electric cars, again, generic skateboard for the most part, like what sets a Subaru apart or a Nissan apart from any other car on the market when you go to electric? I just don't really see the appeal uh, unless you can, you know, whoever swings the the lowest price car into the market first will probably own that section. And then all these other manufacturers just don't have anything to set themselves apart anymore. So I'd be curious to see what happens. You know, you know, what's interesting about that and, and, I'd love us to find someone who I don't know enough to, to talk about this, but uh, there's some guests I have in mind that might be able to. But the the idea, Mike, that you just said, you know, when you work at a shop, you start to realize that a lot of a lot of a BMW is made by like uh, other companies. Right. So a lot of uh, that's with every car. Every car is, you know, water pumps are actually sourced from a, a manufacturer that makes water pumps. Uh, you're cooling hoses. Right. It's not all made by BMW. BMW designs this vehicle and puts this whole thing together. But most of the pieces come from other manufacturers. And the idea of like um, I'm trying to think of like a, a Bosch skateboard right so bosch just makes a a a battery drivetrain chassis that you put the rest of whatever you want on top of it would be a really interesting idea because that also blends into my hope of the of the of the niche builders right because if you can just you know 50 percent of evs on the road are all the same skateboard underneath they're just different people doing different things on top of it for different applications that's really exciting yeah I love that idea. I think you talk about the like the micro brands of the EV world. How do we start seeing more you know startups in that space, not doing massive scale, but using templated like you know base parts from a Bosch or whoever else? Even Tesla, like, do they start to you know sell their drivetrain or something like that? Who knows? Um, I think Ford was first to market right where you can buy the Ford uh, electric motor as a as just a crate motor to, to, to use for other applications, which that's a feature that I think is very exciting. Yeah, I totally agree. I'll throw my two cents in here and then I'll pass it to Zach for final comments on this topic and we'll run into the, the main event. Uh, for me, you know, one brand that hasn't been mentioned yet is Polestar, you know, behind kind of like the VW side of things. I think that's a, a super interesting one. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm unsure if they're going to continue, like make it in the U.S., uh, they're not getting like as much market saturation as you would think. You see, you know, see them driving around every once in a while, and it's a great product, like really great product. But I don't know that it's going to make it. Um, and the other question mark for me is is Lucid. I think it's the same the same type of thing. You look at like a a Fisker, uh, you know, from from back in the day, and them trying to revamp their brand, and and these like very very niche markets that are high end cars that are low production, very expensive to make, I, I think it's going to be tough as we start to, you know, see a lot more on the market. And, and, you know, those cars are really expensive to make those brands are not making money. And so I could see potentially those those falling off. Um, to be controversial, I think Rivian is here to stay. They have some challenges ahead of them. But uh, their product is epic. Those cars are amazing to drive. I think they fit like a a nice category of kind of that adventure outdoor and yeah, I'm, I'm bullish on them for sure. Zach? I wonder if they're, I, I, sorry, I, I, lo- yeah. I don't want to interrupt Zach, but I'm, I know we're doing short, but I love talking about this because do you think that that market in general has exploded right now, right? Like the overlanding outdoor, yeah. you know, you see Subaru bringing out their wilderness editions, right. Uh, of, of the outback and things like that. And, uh, every every four by four is is exploding in value. Like I could sell my FJ for more than what I bought it for. Uh, you know, five six years later now, um, I'm interested if like if the if the the tastes the pop culture taste swings away if it will be as powerful of a brand. That's just an interesting idea because you you kind of mentioned it where yeah it, they're fitting this niche that they're they're owning in, in that in the EV space right now. But I wonder if that niche will dwindle or continue to grow and, and maintain the same, uh, you know, fan base that it has right now. Yeah, I mean, I think 
Mike would back me on this. Like when you look at Subaru as a brand, you know, comparable, they're not making an EV product yet, but they, they certainly represent some of that. Like, excuse me, sir, have you not seen the BZ4X? The, the uh, very easy to remember. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. We know it's coming. (laughs) Have you, uh, that's not a market yet, is it? It is. Yeah. I think they just hit like, like very recently. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So they're getting there, but uh, I guess my point with that was the like the style of the brand, right? They're very like family friendly, outdoor centric. They that's how they represent themselves now in the marketplace. They haven't always done so, but they've done so at least for like twenty years, right? Well, when I think on Subaru, a big part of their selling point originally too was was like Mike said, the drivetrain and, and specifically the all wheel drive. Right. Like this was like, oh, it was the all wheel drive car you could get with it. So you could go do the snow and the family, you know, kind of hikes and stuff without having to have a uh, truck. Uh, and that advantage that is gone. I mean, it's already been eroded by, you know, most a lot of the manufacturers came with all wheel drive. But now with electric, like, I mean, I don't I don't know, but I, most of the ones I can think of off the top of my head have an all wheel drive option. And it's probably, you know, superior in some ways because of the individual control to what Subaru is going to do. So yeah. I don't know that they have yeah, an advantage totally. in that market anymore. Mix. Yep. I, I think you're right on Gallagher for sure. So Zach, give us just two brands off the top. Who's here to stay and who's gone and then take us, take it from there. Um, I really like Mike's take. I like the idea of Tesla maybe kind of breaking the envelope open, but then folding because their practices, maybe not the best wisest approach. I like that idea. I think I'm going to run with that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump us off into our main topic. So state of the market for technicians. So we've, we've kind of talked about this before, and it's not new new news. It's tough to get techs. It's tough to get techs nowadays. It's been tough in the past, but it seems like it's tougher now more than it's ever been. I, I, I think people would resonate with that statement. But I guess what skills and qualities are most valuable for new techs now? What's going to help get new techs into automotive industry in this day and age when we're talking about EV, when we're talking about things shifting? Like, what's going to be the thing to help drive the talent either to join more shops or even to start their own? So what, what do you guys think needs to change? The first thing that comes to my mind with that is that I think there's a longstanding perception, and I've talked to people, you know, that automotive technicians is a is still a perceived as very blue collar and therefore dirty. Um, you know, you're going to come home greasy every night, right? Smelling like gasoline, and that simply isn't the case anymore. Especially, I think arguably it hasn't been for a while, but I think especially with the shifts to EV, this is a high skill, you know, computer electronics you know, blended with mechanical and physical components. Um, and there's, there's a real perception. I was talking to someone who wasn't in the automotive in- industry and she was thinking through, like, we were talking about raising kids. Right. And she's like, well, I wouldn't want them to go. And, you know, my perception of that is that it's, it's, it's less optimal than going and getting a four year college degree and going into some white collar role. And it's, you know, I think that's a that's a big one, and that's culture wide. That's not even in the automotive industry, but I think the automotive industry could do a lot to start to help change that perception and and do education to customers to you know places they want to find technicians about like, hey, this is actually a really cool industry with a lot to offer. That's not that's not the dirty, greasy you know cigarette hanging outside the lip dude leaning over your carburetor that you might have pictured from thirty years ago anymore. I'll pick up on that. Yeah, I I uh, I like that you left with that that point because I'll say that I agree that uh, if there was a time to recruit for technicians, I think I could argue that this is the best time ever to to go ahead and and try and bring in techs into the industry. Uh, it's actively being changed. Like the industry is finally starting to adopt technology. Um, I think that my little guy's crying in the background, and that's probably something you guys can hear. Um, but uh, um, I think it, it really the the stigma of it being blue collar work has lingered around, but maybe partially for good reason. I think the the pay for a technician is low and um, probably single handedly the main reason why no one's interested in this industry. 
Um, you think about the amount of skill and effort it takes to become a proficient mechanic. You know, um, it is on par with an engineer, I would argue. Uh, you know, just the amount of tools and time and energy that you need to put into mastering and honing that craft is uh, in any other industry worth six figures. And um, mechanics are nowhere near that. And, and just case in point, uh, you know, talking to when I was coming up in the shop, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, mechanics that had worked in the 90s were making 70 or $90,000 a year. Um, now, I don't have like an inflation calculator, but that's probably more than 150 k in today's money. And there are probably zero mechanics making that much, if maybe only a handful. So I just think that, um, you know, if you want a good place to start, broadcasting a, a, a six figure salary is is the right place to, to begin uh, making some progress and increasing that talent pool. Uh, and then just having some, some uh, more stuff in place to kind of show how to get to that, that magical number, you know, at two years of experience, you need to be proficient at these things and have accomplished these things five years, six years, seven years. And then by eight years, you should be able to make it to that, that holy grail number that you're after. And I think if you can put that on a billboard and, and broadcast it, I think you would acquire a lot of talent that hasn't even considered going into the industry before. Uh, and I think it's yeah. better now than ever because people are kind of, I think, stigmatized by college and four-year degrees. Like, you know, everyone going through school right now is almost expected to have a college degree and there's nothing to show for it. Like, okay, I got my four-year degree. Now what do I do? Uh, you're you're in the same boat as a high schooler in most cases. So for someone for the automotive industry to kind of step in and say, look, here's here's a, a direct path to a successful career. Um, so if it's something you're interested in, here's every step you need to take to get to where you want to be. And I think a lot of people, including myself, uh, would be a lot more interested in sticking around in that sort of industry. Hmm. Yeah, I'd follow that. I think that I think pays a huge part of it too. Like I have a the buddy who went, you know, even if you set the blue collar quote unquote stigma aside, uh, he went in as an HVAC installer and within 18 months, I think was making low six figures without necessarily having a ton of prior knowledge, without having to buy his own tools, <laughs> without having to go to fund himself through a trade school, right? All the things that a lot of guys getting into the, you know, a lot of people getting into the technician side of things are going to have to do. Right. And so, um, you know, I think for shops, it's like, Hey, how do we make that barrier to entry tool budgets, schooling, you know, things easier financially, but then also getting to a point where we can, as an industry, pay a fair wage for the skill that's, that's accrued there. I think that's a huge, a huge one. I like your point, Mike, about, you know, the stigma around or not I mean, stigma, but the, you know, lack of desire, maybe to go get a four-year degree, right. With the cost that's associated with that right now. Um, it's a really good option. I think it's a really good point. Yeah, th this conversation, I know me and Mike were kind of talking about this a little bit yesterday, but it's a, it's a really hot topic in the industry today. And uh, as everyone's talking through, there's so many so many rabbit holes I think we could go down. And it's just thinking through like <clears throat> what shops can do today to to proactively start doing this, maybe even right now when some of, some of these things that we're talking through, like uh, a widespread... Um, change from like, hey, don't go for a four-year college degree. Also consider this as an option. I know coming out of high school, a vocational school that could have gone through, I could have gone through a step program and whatnot. Uh, college was pushed on me very heavy at that time. And so I chose that option. I, I dropped the four years plus of, of vocational automotive knowledge and went into college. And Mike, you, you brought up something very interesting. I think there's this uh, perception that maybe some shops have of like, oh, well, if someone goes through, through college, they're leaving college and they're, you know, they're making close to six figures coming right out of college. And the reality, uh, uh, the reality of that is I'd we probably have to pull some numbers on this, but I know a lot of folks that went through college and, you know, left college making 40, $50,000, which is pretty much on par with what a technician, correct me if I'm wrong, but on par with what a technician would make in a well-oiled shop if they had, you know, good, good amounts of volume coming in through those doors. So, right out the gate out of college versus right out the gate out of a vocational school, um, the the income potential is usually pretty similar ver depending on what you studied. So um, I just think it, it digs so deep into like having to change that mentality of like, hey, uh, you don't have to go to college. You can do this route as well. Uh, but I think from a shop's perspective, mapping that out, having a career path and I think advertising a six-figure six salary is definitely the way to go. 
if you have the right like steps in place like hey here's the plan before you sign you could check this out and i can show you how you can make that and this is what every year you can expect to make i think that would also change a lot of perceptions um and perspectives uh, i would also be interested i mean my brother is in vocational school or he wrapped up vocational school and nothing like that was presented to them at any shops or internships sure. of like hey you could potentially make this in four to five years it was kind of like, hey, do you like it? No? All right. Well, you know, thanks. And, and that was about it, which is which is a bummer. I think um, there's there's so many so many of these conversations boil down to cultural changes almost oh, that yeah. we have to make, which how do you how do you do that from a single business? But uh, you know, because I think the the mindset, Lucas, that you're talking about is like, hey, do you like this? Great. If not, fine that that's uh, and mike yeah. and i joke about the the environment within a shop being uh the way we interact when i was working at the shop was kind of like aggressively negative like on purpose right we always just constantly made fun of each other that's kind of the the world that we live in uh in that environment not not in a truly intending to tear each other down but that's just how we communicate so i think there's a cultural opportunity there whereas like look at how we recruit in the tech space, right? Like, you know, we're, we're amazing. Look at our culture, look at our people. You're going to love it. Like it's so freaking rad. Like, and then at the shops, like you want to do it, you're going to have to prove your worth, <laughs> you know, right. It's such a different vibe. Uh, you just hit um, the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's, there's a, it, it, right. That comes down, that boils down to cultural change. Um, there's a, if I separate out, right. The, 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 the training path and the, the uh america's views on labor today right a uh, path is a different thing right i think you know some of us here that work on the pre-sales side it's like i constantly see people uh and i want to choose my words wisely because i'm certainly not putting any shop down but kind of fight for your um, limitations i see this happen on a daily basis we're like oh, our team could never figure out how to how to do this. This is too advanced. I'm like, really? You guys can build engines. I'm I'm pretty sure your your team will figure this out if you give them the opportunity. If you give them ownership of of this process. So it, again, boils down to cultural, right? Are these employees people that are uh, disposable labor to you as a shop? Well, heck yeah, you're gonna have a hard time finding technicians. Um, at my shop, we you know everyone's different and every scenario is different. And every market's different. So I don't want to say by any stretch of the imagination that how we did it was correct, but we paid salary, not flat rate. You know, the, there's certainly places and scenarios where flat rate is, is a great opportunity to make money, but we wanted to build careers. We wanted to build people that were invested in the business, invested in the success, not watching the clock, not watching their turnaround, right? Not looking for opportunities to make more, but just looking for opportunities to do better. That's how we built our team. We never had a problem getting techs. It took me a long time to build a team that I was happy with, but every one of the guys that worked at my shop would have recommended other people come and apply when we decided to bring in another technician. So you have a lot of ownership in the environment that you build within your business and how that attracts talent like any other one it, it, it's again cultural right like it, instead of everyone having to prove to you why they're a good technician worth coming to work for you maybe prove to technicians why you're a great shop to work with um just hat tip to um i think mad hatter is one of our customers that we've featured before and they're I follow them on social media. They're they're not doing anything about their business. I mean, they do, but they're mostly just highlighting their team. Like, look what our cool team is doing. Look at the awards they won. Look at where someone that on our team is speaking. And the I th I bet you they never have trouble finding technicians because they just people would want to work there. Um, if I shift away from our 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 uh, community, right, the the shop community can do things better there. If I ship, ship shift over to like education, and again, it's another state of you know how maybe the u.s looks at the labor force right now it's it's it y'all mentioned right it's looked down upon maybe it's a blue collar opportunity it's not as good of an opportunity as as other jobs i would love to see some of the the training um the tech schools and, and training establishments have a real opportunity to hoover in uh, uh, folks looking to change their situation where you're right. I think we're in a, in a tipping point where, uh, four year degrees, the, the debt that comes along with going to, a, a, a an educational institution, uh, and, and what the job market looks like for people coming out of that track, um, 
but our tech schools aren't that much better. I, I ended up here because I started going to look at tech schools and I was looking at not paying the same as a four-year college, but certainly paying a good amount to go to a, a good tech school with no true guarantees of where I would end up after that. Um, so I think I think our educational system has an opportunity to to do a lot better. Um, and where I see a lot of things happening is is community colleges, local training uh, schools. We had we had kids from our local community college uh, intern at our shop. You know, one of those guys turned out to be one of the best employees I've ever worked with. Like, I'm super proud to watch uh, this guy. You know, shout out Gabe too. Uh, you know, watch a kid who is just super smart come in and be like, oh, just amazingly pick up work, just become one of the smartest dudes that I've worked with, and um, all coming through the local college program versus like a very expensive tech school or something like that. Which, which Maria, I think it's, oh, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I think it's worth calling out <clears throat> uh, something that I ran into <laughs> is, uh, you know, a talent, young talent in particular in the shop is almost looked down upon uh, and, and, and uh, penalized in the shop. And I, I think that plays a major role. And, and maybe this is more on the flat rate side of things, you know, in your general repair shops where everyone's competing for the same labor. But <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what I ran into when I first started in the shop was just a lot of competitive, um, you know, yep. technicians who who already knew what they needed to knew uh, to know. To, they already <laughs> knew what they needed to do um, to to fix a car, and for for me to come in younger and and likely faster at doing the same task to to potentially learn how to do the same thing the same way they know how to do it like the the competition just ramps up for them so the incentive for a senior tech to train a young tech is non-existent in a lot sure. of shops and I, I think to your point changing the pay structure and, and giving your team and rewarding them with a salary that um, that they can live on uh, will change the culture overnight in a lot yep. of cases to someone who is getting paid to to be there why not help the young guy or girl that's interested in and passionate like you were when you were younger and um that's such a great point dude just i i never would have thought to say it that way and just want to call you out for that's such an amazing point like what is the incentive for a flat rate technician to teach a younger guy how to do better what there's literally no reason it only costs you money to do that so if you if you don't build an environment to to get your next generation of team members up to par you're you're shooting yourself in the foot what a great point mike that was awesome Thanks, man. And and just to, hey, hey, I'm gonna I, add real quick, Gallagher's got to jump. So, hey, man, no. what, what kind of any final thoughts for you before you got a blast? Yeah, I think that's I would piggyback first what Mike's saying. I think that's huge. Just thinking through how shops, as a, you know, as a business owner, a shop owner, how the pay structure incentivizes culture in the shop. Um, I think one of the things I've seen that I really like is there's some really creative shops out there too, like just outside of pay, right? Okay. So say as a shop owner, you don't feel like it's possible or realistic for you to, to reach pay at that level. What other things can you do to get creative to make your shop the coolest shop in town? All right. For me, for example, I like weightlifting. I lift pretty regularly. One of the things I always thought would be cool is to take a shop. And if there's room, the last shop I worked in had a little bit of spare, spare, uh, room in it would be to like put in a squat rack and a little bit of weightlifting stuff that, that everybody in the shop can use um, and and like make a little bit of your you know personality in culture come into the shop and then attract talent that's that's attracted that I've seen shops that do I remember reading a trade mag with a, a shop that did um, a team yoga class right like once a week in the morning anybody who wanted to come in and do yoga and like stretch out and limber up like there's all kinds of stuff that yeah. I think it's really creative that goes beyond just pay to make a culture in a shop that's a place that people want to be. I mean, you see this happen in tech companies, right, where they're doing free lunches and you got daycare and you got gym. And I realized like for a small business, that's not actually going to be attainable to do all of those things. But you yeah. could probably pretty easily pick something and get a little creative with it instead of just saying, you know, I'm basically a race to, to pay more than the next shop down the street right and and sure. actually put you as the owner your unique sort of flavor and, and brand on how you want run things into it um and yes with that i will i'll jump out but thank you guys um ton of fun i uh, will look forward to catching this one later rock on Gallagher. Gallagher. Brother. bye i think Gallagher you know, makes a good point and it, oh sorry 
No, you're good, Moretti. I was I was just gonna like lean into this idea around like the shifting. I guess the way in which new people coming into the workforce are thinking and, you know, Lucas, you talked on the vocational school side of things and Moretti, you were kind of hitting on like the perception of the auto industry. And, you know, we just have like all of these kind of challenges that are really like predicated by just lack of knowledge to how a technician in today's day and age operates in a shop and and like this kind of older mindset of what what exists in the automotive industry yeah. as a career path and as an opportunity to work on cars and you know we as you guys know like we will we'll talk about it and probably have talked about it either in past or or future episodes like technology is a huge piece of working on cars today and you know for me growing up in uh, you know, V8 muscle car area era. Um, I actually considered going to a, a tech school after high school, and I was I was on the fence. I was like, do I do I go to a and become a technician and start working in this industry from that side, or do I go to a traditional four year college? And I ended up shifting to the four year college space. But at that time, it wasn't. You know, I was like, I could be a technician without having all of this knowledge of crazy wiring and computer programming and all this other stuff. <laughs> and now you, you have to have it. And there's so many young people out there that do have it. And sure. yet, uh, and yet they're not interested in it because they, they don't know that that exists. You know, don't you guys think that that's a part I of think the, it, the issue? I think it's a great point, Justin. And I think it, I think it actually goes back again, right? It, it boils down to culture. Like I, again, my personal experience, not the same everywhere, but in Southern California where I'd spent most of my school life, no school I went to had a shop class. Whereas my cousins back on the East coast had a, a shop class where they were building trucks. You know, uh, I had no access to uh, tools to learning how to do anything myself. As a matter of fact, as a young man, I got tickets for working on my car on the street because you're actually not allowed to do that so that they you'd get a ticket if a cop came by and you had parts of your car pulled apart uh, on a sidewalk parking um so it's uh we've built a uh, we've built a system in some ways that has is as we stare at a technician shortage to, to keep people's cars on the road you look behind you and you're like oh yeah we've made it incredibly hard to get here <laughs> yeah it didn't happen overnight um i think the uh, the other point to Gallagher's point, just to tie something back really quickly, uh, I, I don't know if we're getting to closing thoughts, uh, but we, we've said technicians and then we've also said team members. How, how do we retain and, and look for certain skills from current team members that we can maybe elevate and, and maybe find Great. different positions for to keep them at the shop? Point. I think part of the issue is also that they're leaving at larger amounts because they're finding different opportunities in different industries that are leaning on those skills a little more. If you have someone in the shop, maybe they're a great technician, but they have great interpersonal skills. They're really tech savvy. Maybe they'd be someone really great in front of house to bring in more work. And maybe you could find someone that's a little, a little uh, less experienced from the mechanical side and, and ramp them up to a, a level where you can take on that extra work. So looking for certain skills uh, through in current team members uh, and tying it in what Gallagher was saying, right? Having those incentives, even if they're a few and far between throughout each quarter or each year, uh, I think that could start chipping away internally with the problems that some shops may be bumping into and then yeah. attracting other shops. If I came to a shop and someone said, Hey, listen, we'll, we'll bring you in as a tech. We'll see how you do. Maybe we'll pick up on other, tr uh, other skills or areas that you're really proficient in and we can see what other roles fit you in this industry versus just saying, Hey, you weren't really good fit for us. You're, you know, not hitting the numbers of the times that we're hoping for from a tech perspective. And maybe we're letting go of folks a little too early in those instances. So I don't know if that's the case. I'm just throwing it out there as something to keep an eye out for. That that's actually genius. I think we've done a disservice not talking about people that aren't technicians. I, I got into a shot. I'm not a technician. I'm I'm not very skilled mechanically, but I I wanted to get into automotive because I I had I loved the environment. I love the topic, right? I love the subject. I've been talking about automotive now for an hour, right? I just, I could do it all day. Uh, I had the good fortune to be brought into a shop that 
saw my other skill sets, my systemization, my organization, my soft skills of, you know, uh, as a service writer, essentially working with customer facing work more than, you know, actually fixing cars. And, um, you know, humble brag, it's it's not me, anyone sitting in the chair could have done it. But by having a me, I brought more work to that team and kept them out of the stuff that was slowing them down. Right. So I think, I think that's a great thing. And actually, huge mistake on my part for not talking more about that path to, to the automotive industry that isn't necessarily being the best technician in the shop, but other being really great at other stuff. No, and I don't think we're the only ones. I think we hear technician shortage and I think everyone focuses on that one role and how do we, you know, how do we, how do we make that a a broader topic for the whole shop? I think some shops are embracing it. I think, uh, Matt Hatter, just to shout him out one more time. I think they, they, um, they recognize all their employees from front sure. of house, back of house, regardless of their role. Uh, and they want to make it very inclusive saying, Hey, you are all doing a great job versus just a technician role. Sure. Yeah. Like giving me the warm fuzzies, man. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess my final thoughts is just to, to, to pick up on what they're saying uh, and tie it back to uh, my original thought. Um, I think the, the benefit of broadcasting a, uh, uh, an uncomfortable salary on the owner's part, something that maybe they don't even uh, necessarily think that is, is achievable for them right now. Um, You know, if you look at other industries that are successful at recruiting, like the military, right? Like they, they put the pay structure out there. They tell you all this cool, fun stuff that you're going to get to do in this job. And you attract a lot of people that weren't military people, right? These are people who were in all likelihood, well on their ways to being a veterinarian or a doctor or something else, And by broadcasting that big uh, paycheck, uh, you attract creativity and different types of personalities into the shop and you change the 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 shop environment. So you you kind of, you know, ultimately end up getting other people to recruit more people that are like them uh, just by posting a number, you know, or, or something as simple as that. So. I don't want like anyone listening to this to think that I'm saying just pay your tax more. It's that easy. Um, I mean, I, I think that you're putting an owner in a really uncomfortable position that, um, you know, is going to be hard to pull off. But <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you if you put yourself in, into that position, you open up the doors to more opportunity and, and maybe, uh, you know, figure out and put together the pieces um, as you kind of go along and. And say, okay, here's here's the salary. Let me go ahead and recruit this talent, and then let me figure out how to kind of uh, catch up to to my recruiting efforts. Um, I think it's a it's a huge opportunity for a shop to grow very quickly doing it that way. Yeah, and I, I think that point. I think you have a, a a real opportunity to if you build the uh, investment of the team to how the, how invested they are in the rest of the business that. My, my team, again, uh, you know, every scenario is different. So I, I always like to flag. I don't think this is always the, the best way to do it for every scenario. But my team really, half of it built itself. We brought in some people we really liked. We took really good care of them. They brought in people that they thought they could work well with, that they knew were skilled, that they wanted to work next to because they knew they were going to do a good job as well, right? Nobody's going to recommend a tech, you know a, a fellow employee that they know they're going to be cleaning up after. So our team kind of self-built and we did some work with the interns that we brought in from the school. Right. And, and, uh, but there also was work involved there. I mean, for every, you know, for the good team that I had, I also went through a couple of bad apples and you have to be, that's part of the job. If you want to own and run a business, not to, I think most people know that, but just in case you're new and getting started, right. It did require a lot of work on our part as a, as a management team and as an owner to, you know, go through the people that were, Hey, let's give you a shot. It's not working out. How do, how can we help you get better? How can we help, help you get better? How can we help you get better? Okay. It's not getting better. It's not going to fit. Um, uh, and just doing that work, you know, I would say it took me three years to get to a, like the perfect team that I, that I had. Um, but we, we certainly put in the effort. Shout out to Kevin Costner. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> I like they were just doing. That's from Waterworld, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a great place to end the podcast. It's like, oh, we got some good thoughts. I mean, this is a 
I don't know about you, Zach, but just sitting here and for me listening to Gallagher, Bordeaux, Moretti, Lucas, like all industry experts and having worked in these roles and spent time, you know, tons of time in these shops, um, I get a sense of like appreciation for the complexity that exists there in, in running the business and the challenges that shops are facing today and the, uh, the opportunity to, you know, on the, on the flip side of that, it's like, okay, you got to just be open to breaking the mold and trying stuff different. You know, like that's what I'm hearing from you guys is, is this, this ability to try and shift that perception, you know, go into your local high school, like have conversations with these people, build relationships and, and take a chance, you know, take on, yeah. take a chance on what, what is possible. I don't know, Zach, what, what are you? Yeah, dude, my, my big takeaway is that if you ostrich it and just dump your head into the sand and saying, this is what I've been doing and this is how I'm going to do it forever you're probably going to get left behind just, and even if it just feels so overwhelming that that's what you want to do, try to resist it. And I liked what Gallagher said, if you can't do everything, that doesn't mean do nothing. Just, just pick one, pick one yeah. thing and try to try to move that ball forward. Yeah. And for the, for the technicians out there or like the young professionals coming out of high school, thinking about that decision to go to college, to go to a tech school, to that's interested in the automotive industry get out there and talk to some of these shops and spend some time in that space and understand what it is like now and what the opportunities are like now and in the future versus, you know, kind of that perception of what the old school mechanic in a hot rod (laughs) shop is doing today. Right. I I think that is, that's a, a gap, a knowledge gap that we're, we're all kind of talking about exists. I think um, if I know we're kind of wrapping up, but if I could share a, a shorter story, because I think it applies to what you're saying. I think uh, there's some responsibility on shop owners to get creative because I think there is a cultural change in how, right, like I said, how tech recruits versus how shops recruit and maybe owners have to get more, owners, managers have to get more creative or just more look at what the market looks like and how talent is is approached and how they could approach talent versus you know the other industries but also to flip it like if you're a young person you know you're looking to get into uh, whether it's a tech or, or something else there, there's a huge difference between um, a lot of industries I see there's a there's a, a gap between wanting to work there and working there and it's a very digital gap it's sending in resumes trying to get an interview that kind of stuff uh, walk into a shop shake hands. This industry does definitely have some old school ideals around go in, go in, bug somebody. I mean, we had people that came in and bugged us until we let them try out stuff like that. I think it's, it's, uh, there's certainly, you know, it sounds like such a, a kind of old man thing to say, but like a a hearty handshake goes a long way. If you want to try to change what you're doing or you're interested, even if you don't get a job, man, we had people that just kind of hung out and learned a lot with us. So, uh, and, and, to flip it, shout out to, to the owner of the shop I worked at where very rare, but uh, sometimes he would turn a, a sale, a business opportunity of building an engine into a training opportunity and bring someone in and let them build an, their own engine next to our team because they were interested in that. And there's no money in that for the shop, but it, it in terms of the culture and the community around the shop, it, it paid dividends over and over and over. So the, the, the responsibilities on both sides of the table, though. Folks, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for all the comments and the insight. For those of you listening, continue the conversation. What do you think? Do you think Rivian is ugly as Gallagher says it is? Now, try to help each other out. The only way we're going to get through this all is together. Um, And like Justin likes to say, onward. All right. Onward, guys. We appreciate you all. Talk to you later. Cheers. Cheers. See you, everyone.